you have an iPad and a charging cord, use, we're going to be talking about those a little bit today. So if you want to grab um, your iPad, if that's a teacher iPad, a student iPad, your own iPad, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. As I show you things today, feel free to try them out on your own. So if that means you need to move the screens around a little bit, minimize some of the Zoom window that you're seeing so that you can try it on your teacher device, do that. Otherwise, no, this is being recorded. It should be uploaded by tonight so you can play it back and pause as needed and try it on your teacher machine if that is easier as well. And you just want to sit back and kind of watch as we talk about things today. So, okay, so this is a follow up of our make our own video series. We've been talking quite a bit about making instructional videos. I think that this is a great way for you to kind of clone yourself or to provide a very specific task for students to do either synchronously or asynchronously. And basically what I mean by that is just, um, if you are doing synchronous Zoom lessons and you need to do a smaller group breakout room, for example, having your students turn to a Canvas video assignment that you might have up or providing that for them um, to do while you're doing a small breakout room is a great way to kind of clone yourself in a synchronous environment. But then it's also a great way for you to provide instruction that's specific to our priority standards and also a way for you to kind of humanize the experience for your students because it's you giving the instructions. Today, as I've been kind of working on trying to break down what we focus on for interme intermediate and basics, I decided today to kind of try and keep it simple. To, um, for the advanced version, we're going to talk all about editing. So we're going to get kind of into the nitty gritty moving into iMovie. So today is mostly about using um, our iPads potentially, using QuickTime, and then talking a bit more about YouTube and your YouTube channel um, so that you can make the most out of that experience for your students. So that's kind of the plan for today. I feel like as I look through the slides, and you might notice it too, it feels like there's less to talk about. There's a lot to kind of explore and it hopefully will give us enough time to have um, questions at the end too, if you feel like that is um, something that I need to go over. So uh, my name is Nicole Carter. I'm a part of the digital curriculum crew. Uh, I have been in the district for I think like six years. Prior to that, I was 12 years in the classroom teaching English language arts. And I was a flipped classroom teacher for four years prior to that. So I've been making videos for a very, very long time. As I've said in my other sessions, <clears throat> um, it was a, sorry, gradual process for me. Um, I just kept adding to my skills as I became more competent, it became more second nature. I started trying more and doing more. And I think that you just need to remind yourself, give yourself grace, build on your skills as you can. And um, don't expect that you have to jump into the deep end right away and make crazy, amazing videos like you maybe have seen other people post on YouTube. You can get there. That's not what's important. Um, I think the most important part is providing your face and your voice and specific content to meet the needs of your students. Um, that's the most important part. Okay, so um, <laughs> I was fiddling around with this today, I think, and I didn't change my arrow there. So that's making me laugh because I hate when it doesn't look like I want it to look. So today we're talking mostly about engaging in teaching. But as I said previously, I also think it veers into the category of providing that check and response option. Because again, it can be a way for you to clone yourself, provide a specific task for students while you are doing some of those small group instruction pieces. So um, keep in mind that we're kind of veering into that other other realm there. Um, as always, the equity lens questions come up and I've been repeating myself on every single session um, because I, this blew me for a loop. Um, on Tuesday, someone mentioned that one of our families in the, in the district talked about the fact that some of the um, text that is used when we're presenting information doesn't translate easily for some of our families when they set up their Google Chrome, for example, um, and they set up that their that their home language is, is Spanish and it automatically translates. Well, for example, Comic Sans doesn't translate nicely 
on the other end. So um, we're going to be working on trying to come up with some um, preferred font choices uh, for those translation and accessibility features. And I just think that that's one of those things that as soon as someone mentions it, it should be forefront in our mind. Not only accessibility by reading, but also those translation pieces. That might be something we've never thought about before, and that just needs to be a part of how we kind of move forward. So. As a person that makes a lot of my videos using slide decks and teaching from slide decks, thinking about the presentation and the information design is incredibly important for lots of different reasons. Okay, so the first one I wanted to talk about was accessing our iPad through Zoom. I mentioned this previous, uh, previously today when I was doing my intermediate Zoom tips or tricks. I just wanna mention how amazing and easy this whole process is when you have an iPad. So basically all you need is your teacher iPad and a, a lightning cord, your charging cord. And so what you're gonna do is just plug in your device straight to your computer. In fact, I'm doing mine now. And then as you open up Zoom, you go into your share screen. Now in this instance, we're talking about making a video. Can you record straight on your iPad using the iOS screen record feature? Sure. Are there some apps that record straight off of the iPad? Yes. There's a reason why I'm kind of recommending we do it a different way. Um, when I write with a stylus, when I use something on my iPad, um, it picks up when I record using an app on the device or if I'm using the iOS screen recording thing. And let us know in the chat if you want me to show you what that even looks like because I can. But what I've noticed is when I'm writing with my stylus, then um, it's picking up all of my stylus um, noises as I'm writing on the, the device. It's picking that noise up and it's very distracting. So I would recommend actually doing either through Zoom or I'm going to show you how to do it with QuickTime as well um, to avoid the, the stylus noise that just automatically picks up when you do the other options. So once you go into um, hooking this up to your, to your laptop, then you open up Zoom and you go to your share screen option. When you go to your share screen, you'll notice that there are two options here. There's one where you can show your iPad or iPhone through AirPlay, and then there's one that shows you through a cable. Now, if you do not have an iPad, but you have a phone, you could do the exact same thing. Um, and this is when I've shown in the past how people have created, created like document cameras using their phone. This would be one way you could do that. Um, but anyways, I'm recommending using the cable because as you may have figured out, there are a lot of different things that will lag and slow, um, slow our recording and slow even when we're showcasing to students. And um, by doing an AirPlay or Bluetooth Connect, that will pull from your Wi-Fi data or pull from your internet data and will slow you down and slow down what they see on their end um, or slow down your recording, your instructional recording. So I would recommend using the cable when you can. Sometimes it's cumbersome and it can get in your way, but when you can use the cable, that's just going to give you a smoother process and recording, if that makes sense. So once you go in, it couldn't be simpler, you guys. You go in, you click that and um, click share. So now you are seeing my iPad screen. Right. So if I were doing um, an instructional video where, for example, I was maybe um, wanting the kids to read through an article with me and record. So I'm using the app Notability, which is the one I would highly recommend if you're thinking about doing any kind of annotation work or whatever. This is what I would recommend is Notability, um, which we can talk about in a little bit. But um, I would go through this, do my highlighting, do my annotation, maybe my little sketch notes or whatever. I'm recording, remembering if I'm doing this as an instructional video through Zoom, I share, I hit record, and I go through. Again, we're um, minimizing the amount that you're hearing those distracting, you know, touching the iPad with your stylus um, sound. It's super distracting. Um, and and this is like, this is it. This is, this would be how you would go through. So for, if you were thinking to yourself, gosh, I wish I had my document camera or whatever, um, that would make things really helpful. So what I would recommend instead, you don't need a document camera. You can just use 
something like this. I wouldn't even, um, the document camera is basically a live video stream, right? So a camera pointing down as you're writing. Instead, I would use like a whiteboard app or something like this, Notability. Um, if you have, you know, a, a printout that you wanted to write over the top of, I'm trying to think of how we normally use our document cameras, right? So we're either using just a plain white piece of paper where we're writing, we're using a printout and we're writing over the top of it. All of that can be done straight in a whiteboard app or something like Notability where you're just writing over the top. So you can add an image. So for example, this isn't meant to be a Notability app walkthrough, but like, let's say I'm pulling, I don't know. You guys can see what I'm doing though. So, um, so let's say, you know, I, this is fifth grade. Let's just say I'm wanting to write over the top of this. So I just took a picture. So it's no longer a live camera feed. It's a picture feed and, um, I can write over the top of it. I can highlight over the top of it. I can zoom in, right? And then I'm recording everything that I'm doing. So you don't need a document camera. You can just take a picture or you can upload a PDF file, do the same thing. Um, this was, uh, this, what I was showing you before was a Wonderopolis article, but it could easily be a Newzella article that I'm moving into an app and writing over the top of. And again, you're just hitting record. All right. So uh, let's go back here. And the next one we're going to talk about is instead of using Zoom, which again, remembering that Zoom is super easy for us. You just click open a new by yourself Zoom room. You do the share out just like I just showed you, click record and you're off and running. If you didn't want to use Zoom, another option you have is QuickTime. So I didn't really talk about QuickTime last time. Um, in my evolution of making videos, I went from using Screencast-O-Matic to um, eventually getting tired of that platform. And um, I found QuickTime. A lot of people were recommending QuickTime. QuickTime is just already a part of your computer. And so you don't have to install anything. It's your it's software that's already included in our teacher, our teacher MacBooks. So um, to do the same kind of deal with your iPad, uh, you can go in with the charging cord, open up QuickTime, and I can show you too, if you don't know how to find it on your computer, would that be helpful if I show you how to find QuickTime? To find QuickTime, I'm gonna do another share screen. Okay, so when I'm in my laptop, there's a couple of things I can do. I can either go into the top right-hand corner, the spotlight search, and search QuickTime, and it should find it for me right away. Or you can also go into your apps. So you can hit, if you still have this launch pad that looks like a rocket down here, you can hit that. Or um, on your keyboard, it's the one that has like six boxes lined up, two rows of three. If you click that on your keyboard, it will open it up too. Um, and there's a search feature up here at the top where you can just click that, or it's in this other folder. There it is. Okay. Now I use it so much that I actually have it in my doc down below. I don't know if you guys know how to add things to your doc, but if you open up this um, platform or any other application, if you right click on it and you go here to options, then you can say keep in doc or remove from doc. So like um, if you've got stuff on here that you never use, like I don't ever use Firefox. I don't ever use Safari. I don't ever use any of the Microsoft products. I remove those from my doc. And these are all of the things that I use on a regular basis, right? So I just right click on them and I say, keep in doc, that, if that is helpful for you at all. So QuickTime, I open up QuickTime and I can do the exact same process. So I'm gonna switch back over to the screen here. Okay. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna open up QuickTime, you've got your, your iPad plugged into your laptop, and then you're gonna go to File, and you're gonna go to New Movie Recording. 
When you do that, um, if you've never plugged your iPad into your teacher laptop, it also might pop up on your iPad. Um, do you trust this computer? And you're going to say, okay, yes, I trust this computer. Once you do that, it should show up. Um, if you don't see your screen showing up, then what you have to do is you have to click the little down arrow that shows up next to the recording button. And instead of FaceTime camera, you should see your iPad right underneath that. Um, so you just want to double check that, that, that that's there and then it should show up. Um, this is a tool that I use all the time um, when I'm doing Zooms, when I'm recording things. It's also something I do when I go into a teacher's classroom and I want to share what's on my iPad, but I don't want to do Bluetooth because again, um, Bluetooth can sometimes be inconsistent. So using that charging cord is extremely helpful. Um, okay. So um, I briefly mentioned some iPad annotation and whiteboard apps. So I went into um, self-service on um, a teacher iPad to try and see what you guys had access to. So um, Jamboard is very similar to Padlet if you've ever used Padlet before. So, I mean, you could definitely use Padlet, but in this instance, Jamboard, the app is actually really amazing, has good um, stuff that you don't have access to on the Chrome browser, actually. You also have the ability to use um, the app Show Me and educations through self-service. And then the one that I recommend or the one that I would use the most is Notability, but Notability is a paid for app. Um, it's $9.99, which is a lot. Um, it does all the things, which is why it's kind of expensive. However, um, we have put it out there for a lot of teachers, especially our math secondary teachers. They all have access to Notability. It is very easy for you to back up any of your notes to Google Drive with Notability, and then you can provide a folder, like on Canvas, for example, for your students to access any of the notes that you took on Notability. You put that folder on Canvas once and you don't have to touch it again, and the kids can constantly go back and access any of your notes that you might have used when you made your video recording. So um, if you are interested in Notability, if your team or department is interested or more teachers in the building are interested in Notability, if you can get 20 people that say they want it, then approach your admin and say, we have 20 people that want this. At 20 people, you get 50% off. So it goes from 9.99 to 4.99, right? And that might be a little bit more accessible for building site funds to purchase or whatever, but Notability is a really great app for a reason. Um, and it is one that I think would be a good part of your teacher kit if you are a person that needs to annotate um, things often. Okay. Um, Another thing I wanted to quickly talk about with, with QuickTime, and this was something, I don't know if Bruce is with us again today, but he was with us last week. And I didn't even know, as much as I use QuickTime, I didn't even know that QuickTime allows you to trim and edit um, your videos. So that just basically means if you start QuickTime and there's a little bit in the front end where you, um, were, you know, getting your teaching materials ready to go and you don't want the kids to, to see you, fumbling around, you can trim that bit off. So um, you, it doesn't allow you to trim in the middle. That's where we would move the video file into iMovie. So we're gonna talk about iMovie in the next session, but you can at least trim the front end and the back end of your videos straight in um, QuickTime. So um, if you aren't going to use your iPad and you just wanna do a screen recording with QuickTime, so this is, this is what I do most of the time if I'm not going to use Zoom, if I'm not going to use Screencastify, if I'm not going to use Screencast-O-Matic. I've tried all of those things and I'm frustrated with what I can and can't do. That's when I go to QuickTime because I'm not necessarily limited in my time for QuickTime. So um, I, go to, I go to QuickTime, I open up new screen recording, I get my teaching materials up and I'm just running through everything. Now the down, the downside of QuickTime is that it doesn't record both your, your face and your screen. So if you have students that really want to see your face in that whole process, there's a way to do it. It's just more cumbersome. Um, but the other piece with, with QuickTime is, again, you don't have to download anything to your machine. It's already there and it's pretty easy to get started. 
Uh, once you click new screen recording, then you're going to make a decision if you're going to record the entire screen or if you're going to drag and record just a small section of your screen. Uh, it is important once you open up the, the recording piece to make sure that it's getting your audio. As I've said before, I've done so many um, recordings where my audio wasn't tracked at all. And so sometimes you have to just double check that it's recording wherever your sound is coming through. So like, for instance, right now I'm using AirPods. I would just want to, before I hit record, double check that the sound input is coming from my AirPods. Um, and then it's funny because it kind of hides where um, the recording button is. It's this tiny little thing up in your top toolbar, up where your, your name and your and your time is. So you just have to find that stop record or the record button. And once you press that, then it will stop your recording and save your file. Um, it pops up in a new window right there on your screen for you to decide what you want to do with it. And that's where you could decide if you want to trim. Anytime you open up a QuickTime file, you can trim front and back. Um, you're just going to go up to edit. And then you're going to go to um, split clip or trim clip. It's trim. You're going to go to trim clip. Okay. Um, okay. The first one, Nicole, would be as we're thinking about doing some of this synchronous learning with kiddos, is there a way that we can share our iPad half screen and your face on the other? And if that's not the case, can you talk about maybe using your iPad and yourself in the same Zoom meeting on like different screens? So, okay, so we're not talking necessarily about making an instructional video. We're talking about synchronous instruction in the classroom where we're sharing both our face. And so I guess I would ask when you, when I was sharing my video of my iPad before, you didn't see my face? Because my, I, you should still see my face in the big, you know, Brady Bunch window, mm -hmm. right? And then just, and then my share screen should be in a separate window. So you should still be able to see it. And then if you are making an instructional video where you're actually hitting record, your, video, your face will be a small portion at the top and then your iPad video or share screen will also be there. Right. So right. Zoom, would, Zoom, should, Zoom should allow you to see both. Yeah, yeah, it was one thought on bigger. And I think one piece might be just teaching kids how they can um, exit full screen on viewing the teacher's yes. whatever shared piece and kind of mm -hmm. doing that side by side. Oh yes, I, I cannot stress enough. And that's something I was talking about earlier this morning with the Zoom training. Um, just like we don't know all of the buttons that are inherent to Zoom. I mean, the kids don't know either. Like bare minimum, they know how to turn video on and off and audio on and off. But until you start to show them how, and, and I mean, quite frankly, sometimes it's hard for us too because the buttons and things on a Chromebook are drastically different than our teacher MacBook, right? So um, I sometimes will jump on, this is my daughter's Chromebook. So I'll sometimes jump on my daughter's Chromebook and try to see how to manipulate um, on, and I, I have it somewhere. It might be in my Zoom tips or tricks, but on a Chromebook, they do have a button. Um, and they also, you know what, like on our, books, your fingers do different things on the trackpad. So for example, everybody try this for me. It, it shouldn't mess anything up. It will come back, but use three fingers on your trackpad and flick up. When you do that, it shows you all of your screens and windows that you currently have. Now use your three fingers again and flick down. Now the exact same thing can be done on the Chromebook. They can flick three fingers up and flick three fingers down either on the monitor screen or their trackpad and it will show all of their windows that they have. But they also have a button on here too that allows for them to see the different windows. And it looks kind of like it's a square with two lines next to it, but that's the button that they would pick or, or select or touch to show them all the windows that they have open. I, that is a huge, huge tool that the students need to know how to move and maneuver between different windows, even for our littlest ones, because there are many like math sessions and things that they will have to have multiple screens. Seesaw, this math manipulative open and this one. So they need to, they need to get that direct instruction from, from us constantly. 
on exactly what the expectations are and how to maneuver things. We can't just, you know, assume that they know how to do it. If we don't know how to do it, they sure don't know how to do it, right? What was the other question? Did I answer it? Sorry, I feel like I went off on a tangent. No, that was how we get off. The best tip or trick I can tell you with this is to get Zoom open and hit that orange button for new meeting and just start playing around a little bit, as well as getting a group of your teammates or department, you know, your department together and get in a Zoom where each of you are co are hosts or co-hosts or whatever. So you can play around with some of the controls and get um, more familiar, especially um, we, I wanted to try and find out what the exact dates are, but we have officially bought the pro version of Zoom for you guys. So having access, for example, to like polling will be coming out shortly for you. Um, the ability to open up security features and stuff like that all become apparent um, when you are the host. It's harder when you're in a Zoom meeting like this to try and get all that stuff to work. So um, I would say unplug your device, replug it in, restart your computer, restart your computer. Sometimes I have problems with QuickTime. I haven't ever had an issue with it, with Zoom, but sometimes I have problems with connecting the iPad with the with the cord on to QuickTime. For some reason, sometimes it doesn't recognize the device when I do that drop down menu. So again, for the iPad on QuickTime, you have to go to the new movie recording. So everything else I've told you should be screen recording, but for the iPad, it's new movie recording. So it won't work if you do it in the other options. Um, but if you're in the new movie recording, and then you have to go into the drop down menu and switch it from your FaceTime camera to your iPad. And if it doesn't see your iPad at that point, then that's where I would unplug, replug, restart your computer, and it should show up at that point. Sometimes, too, you need to make sure when it says, Do you trust this computer? You want to say yes, because that can also limit the capabilities as well. Ever, I'm, let's see, I'm going in. So, again, new movie recording, it, that little screen opens up so okay i'm gonna do so you can see what i see so i'm in quicktime can you guys see that i'm in quicktime yep. this window is my quicktime recording so right now it's picking up my facetime hd camera right so there's my there's my ipad so if this isn't showing up then the only thing i've ever done Unplug, replug, restart my computer, and try again. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Yeah. But again, you have to be, you have to be, it's not new screen recording. It's new, it's the new movie recording. It's the only place Got that it. the iPad should show up. I think we're kind of moving into talking a little bit about YouTube. Um, <clears throat> okay, so on your teacher device, I'm going to want you to open up um, a new tab and go to YouTube. Okay, so once I'm in YouTube, you're gonna go into the top right hand corner and look for your initials and then you're gonna go to your channel. Once you hit your channel, if you haven't started your channel yet, then it will, you, you need to go through the process of starting your channel. Um, once you're in your channel, it should show you any and all of your videos, your playlists, okay? Um, when you are wanting to do any kind of uploads or you're wanting to do any kind of edits, you wanna go to YouTube Studio. This is also a way for you to quickly upload a video, okay? So you can either click this little camera guy or you can go to YouTube Studio. You also should be able to, in the top right hand corner, go to YouTube Studio right away. You don't necessarily need to go to your channel first. You can go to YouTube Studio right away. Now, once you're in your YouTube um, Studio, it goes straight into this dashboard, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to show you in here. How's my time? I'm doing okay on time. Okay. So, um, the first thing is when you go into videos, you can up update things here in your video feed at any time. So if you made a video that you no longer want your students to see, then you can update that at any time. Now, 
all of mine are public and that's because we want you guys to be able to access them. But if you are in 13 or below, then we definitely would recommend that you make your videos unlisted, especially if students are in the pictures. If you're just doing instructional videos though, that it's just like your face and your content, it can totally be public. It doesn't need to be unlisted. Um, the unlisted is really only if you've got students in the, in the video themselves. Um, so you can change the visibility at any time. You can change any of the details and content title and the details can be changed at any time. Um, for some reason, and I'm trying to figure out why they're doing this, but um, if you know anything about tags or hashtags, like the reason that hashtags are on there is so that it helps with the algorithm, it helps for searching. So um, in order to change a tag on a video, you have to select the video and then you have to go to edit and go to tags. Now, the only reason I say tags might be helpful is because I think at some point we might wanna create some sort of community, some sort of Beaverton School District community where we're sharing these things. And I think if we create some sort of hashtag like BSD flipped videos or BSD instructional videos, I don't know, I haven't come up with the hashtag yet, but adding in a tag right here would allow us to be able to search each other's content on YouTube to be able to see what other people are creating. Um, but you can also do bulk edits as well. So if you have a whole bunch of videos that students have already seen and you don't want them to see it anymore, you can select all of your videos and turn them to private, for example, and shut down access at any one time. So you can do bulk edits from this particular spot. Um, you also can create playlists for your students. So for example, if you have videos that belong in one specific um, unit, you could create all of those instructional videos and then move them into a playlist and then share the playlist with students. Um, I don't necessarily know that you need to do that for kids because I think in my head when I'm thinking about how we give the videos to students. In Seesaw, we're recommending, especially if you have real, real young littles, that you would upload to YouTube, embed the YouTube video into a Google slide, and then share the Google slide in Seesaw. If you're with older kids and you're using Canvas, you would just share the YouTube URL to Canvas and it automatically embeds and you don't have to worry about the ads or whatever. So you don't really need a playlist. Um, but if that helps you with organization, playlists are easy to create, um, especially when you're uploading something. So I'm gonna go back into the upload category. So let's say I want to upload, I know I had a video, hold on. Um, do I have a short video? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You guys all have to watch this right now. Oh, yes, I do. It's just kind of hidden. Okay, so let's just say I'm uploading a video. I have no idea what this is. But here's, here's your screen once you upload. So you've got your title, you've got your description. Your thumbnail is automatically selected as it processes your video. But if you would like to add a pretty thumbnail so that that's the, the start or what people see when they search for stuff, you can create anything. You could create a video um, thumbnail on like a slide deck and just take a screenshot and upload it right here. Um, so for example, let's just say I want the video to have this one. So that was just, that was a screenshot of a slide deck and that that will be the thumbnail for that video and then from here you can select a playlist as you're kind of going um you're going to say what audience it's for yes or no i'm going to say no because this is for teachers and then i hit next i don't do anything on this screen i just hit next and then this is where you set your visibility this is your link that you would embed either in Canvas or on a Google slide. So you can copy it right there even before it's finished publishing. So then you have a little bit of time at this point where it processes. Um, so it's not, it's not available right away. This is a short video, so it'll process really fast. Now, technically, I don't want anyone to see that because it was nothing. I don't even know what it is. So I'm making it now private. No one can see it and I can delete it too at any time, right? So I can delete that. 
Okay. Um, additionally, one thing I wanted to show you as well on here is you also have like an audio library. Now this becomes more intense with our advanced session next week as we start talking about um, adding audio and intros and outros and transitions and and you know all of that great editing stuff. I didn't tell until recently that this was even here, but if you are interested in any of those extra additions to the editing component, is you can go here and download all sorts of free audio. And sometimes the audio um, has um, attribution attached, but you can also do a filter where you can find things that you don't have to um, give attribution to. You can just use it free of charge. Um, but they have all sorts of background tracks and sound effects and all sorts of things that you can download straight here from YouTube, which I think is pretty cool. Um, within YouTube, you also have the ability to do a little bit of editing as well. Um, it's not very robust. Again, I would recommend that you um, do a lot of that editing in iMovie before you upload here to YouTube, um, if that's something you're interested in. And then finally, I wanted to go over just a few pieces of vocabulary with YouTube. So you have a channel, so that's where all of the content lives for you and your brand or person, right? A YouTuber is a person that's making money off of creating videos on YouTube and monetizing the, those videos. So that's, you know, ads being played in the middle of their, of their video. Um, a subscriber is like you subscribing to a channel or a YouTuber because you like that content and you want to be notified when any of their content comes up and is available. Um, by providing a like or hitting that like button, it just changes the algorithm within YouTube so that videos are more available. Um, and then finally the notification. So like, if you really love the channel crash course because of its educational content, you can subscribe to it and you can turn on the notifications. So whenever they come out with a new video, uh, you are notified or it hops up into your home screen so that you can see those videos. You can create playlists within YouTube of things that you want to watch, um, whether that's watch later or the playlist, like I said before, like um, a unit playlist, for example. Watch later is something I use when I consume content. Like I no longer watch TV for the most part. And my team likes to make fun of me for this, but I don't watch TV anymore. I just watch YouTube which I know that's kind of scary to think of, but that's all I watch. And I predominantly watch through my watch later playlist. So as I find videos I wanna watch, I just say save to playlist, they, play, they save to my watch later. And I cycle through that um, when I'm sitting down in the evening to watch TV. Um, and then uh, the playlist again, that's something that's curated by you for a specific reason. So like you can see on here anytime Anytime I'm in a teacher's college presentation and they use a specific video to highlight something, some sort of teaching tool, I automatically find those videos and save it to a playlist. So it's stuff like that that you can um, find very helpful. So like you could go out and start looking for how to make your own videos, intros and outros, and make a playlist. You could go out and find how to teach with Zoom and find all of these great videos on how to actually teach during CDL with Zoom and create a playlist so that you have those and have access. It's almost like bookmarking information through YouTube. Um, okay, so lots that you can play around with and do with YouTube, but just know you have a teacher YouTube channel and all of your content can go on there and be shared from there to students. You can't upload like a 15 minute video to Canvas. Canvas just won't allow you to do that. Okay, so I've hit the end. We're gonna open it up to questions. And um, yeah, Chris and Carrie guide me. And if there's some that come up in the chat now, then we'll do that. Yeah. All right, so we'll go ahead and stop the video there so I can have less to edit later. And um, hopefully we put the course evaluation into the chat for you guys and the self check-in. Um, course eval is really helpful for us to know what you would like to see next. And maybe if what I talked about in the video advanced course doesn't sound good to you, I can change it before next week. Um, if there's some things that you feel like should still be touched on, as you get started and start playing around with things, feel free to email me at any time. Um, and just so we know, as we get closer to pre-service and we start learning more about like what our Wednesdays might look like or whatever, um, 
knowing what kinds of PD you might need later on in the school year will also be helpful with that eval.